So today, I'm going to talk to you about superpowers and the technology that enables those, right? So I'm going to take you back a bit to a, uh, a small little town in Central Africa called Kitwe, right? And it was on this mining town that I grew up. And I mean, technology hadn't arrived in Kitwe. I mean, how media hadn't arrived in Kitwe. I mean, we had no television, and I spent much of my delinquent youth, you know, playing in the backyard, and some of my time in my parents' library. And in my parents' library, uh, behind some sort of dog-eared uh, vinyl records, was a compilation of punch magazines from the early 1900s. Now, I don't know if you know Punch Magazine, but Punch Magazine was the period equivalent of satirical late night TV, right? With all the, the pithy sort of uh, political satire. It's, it's as if you took Stephen Colbert and shoved him into a book, right? And, and in, in this particular compilation, it was uh, 19, uh, 1906, December. They challenged the writers and the illustrators to come up with predictions or forecasts of what would be happening the next year in, in 1907. And a lot of this was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, whimsical. You know, here, uh, this is a forecast of, of what would happen, and it's, uh, you know, fireworks for daylight consumption, right? But, but on page... 451. They had these two people in Hyde Park under a tree. And as you can see, they had these antennas sticking out of their hats, right? And they had these boxes on their laps. And they had, uh, I guess, the 19th century, early 19th century uh, equivalent of, of big data spewing out in the form of ticker tape, right? And, and underneath it reads, uh, these two figures are not communicating with one another, right? And the lady is receiving ambulatory messages and the gentleman some racing results. So let's pedal forward 100 years. <laughs> They're still not speaking to one another, right? And, and for sure, one of these characters is getting love messages and another one is getting sporting results. Nothing much has changed. But the aspiration that we can enable ourselves to do amazing things is still there, right? And, 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 and these things that we can call sort of superpowers, you know, the, the, the idea that, that we can become superheroes by, by putting on all these the tooling around us is, is still very evident. And so, we all aspirationally, and I think this is why we have a proclivity to like superheroes, because they afford us the ability to see into the future, right? And so, so like if you take you know, the, the device that our, our protagonists have in their hand, and you think of it as you know, some sort of you know, invincible sword, you know, omniscient sword of data, right? At the end of this, I, I have everything I want to be able to be the super smart kid in the room, right? And, and then, then the, the, uh, the privacy shield, right? When I'm at that, that really boring soiree, I can pick it up and pretend that I'm receiving emails so I don't have to speak to anybody, right? These are super tools that we have at our fingertips. And, and, and if we look at superheroes, those, those magnificent tools, those, those, those wonderful things that, they, that make them who they are, didn't come in, 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 in one big package. If you look at, for example, uh, you know, Superman, uh, and you look at you know, Kal-El, who came you know, from uh, Krypton in, in 1938, right, with his standard issue of, of uh, super strengths and super powers, right? So came packaged with, you know, super speed, super strength, super hearing, x-ray vision and vulnerability. Pretty good. But it was only four years later that he got flight, right? 
flight only came four years later. I mean, how would he have picked up Lois Lane if he hadn't had the super strength and super power of flight, right? And then and heat vision came in 49. Super ventriloquism came in the 50s. Super breath, super breath in 54. And, and super breath was very much an Elon Musk type, you know, superpower. He could blow people into space. Early SpaceX. And, and, and the one that I like uh, the, the most is, is the power to make other people superheroes, which only came in 19, oh, uh, 2007. And, and so, so these, these powers came in, 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 in tranches, right? And very much like the superpowers that we have as humans, right? Our superpowers sort of came in tranches, right? And, and the p superpowers that we, we often talk about are the superpowers of the Industrial Revolution. And, and at this TED Talk, you know, we, we've, we've heard a lot of people talking about those powers, right? The, the first superpower of, you know, steam, right? What did that do? That took us from an agrarian society to an urban society. Fundamentally changed the way we are as humans. And then the, the next superpower came, you know, with the second Industrial Revolution in 18... Uh, 70, and, and that was the superpower of electricity and, and the superpower of oil and steel, and we had factory automation, fundamentally changing the way we are as people, as, as a civilization. And then, in 1969, we got the computer, right? And that really changed this room, right? Because, because the, the computer enabled us to have a digital twin. Once you have a digital twin, you're so much more powerful than your corporal, uh, corporate, uh, corporal entity. You now you can network with people around the world. You can store knowledge. You can amplify everything you are as individuals. And now we're in the fourth industrial revolution with tons of superpowers. So potpourri of superpowers, right? We have, you know, uh, IoT. You know, we have nanotechnology, we have blockchain, we have all these, these solutionings like robotics, which are fundamentally changing the way we are as humans, giving us real superpowers. And, and really, what, what is this, what, in sum, what are these superpowers doing for us? Well, they're giving us unlimited access. Unlimited access to information, that's the internet, right? That's the omniscient you know, sword, right? But then we have unlimited access to communications through social media. We have unlimited access to ideas, like this TED Talk. And we have unlimited access to shopping, Amazon Prime, labor, you know, through Mechanical Turk, professional services, you can just do that through a smart contract on the blockchain. And you have lodging and entertainment and food and mobility and VR experiences. All of those are brought to you by some nice unicorn in the valley, right? And, and I'm not saying that we all have access to this globally, but aspirationally we do, right? If, you know, uh, I know uh, Gibson's quoted too much on this, but you know, the future is here, but not exactly evenly distributed, right? But, but I think we all feel globally that we have an inalienable right to this access. And so I'm gonna take you a quick, just go through a quick history of superpowers, you know, from mid-century. So, you know, what, what happened is that we went from a situation where, you know, the, the human was in the center. On one side you had the desk, and on the other side, you had a ledger and files, right? And then we, we automated that through the computer. And, and, and basically, we turned the desk into a desktop. And we turned the person into programs. And we turned the ledger into a database. And that evolved, right, to laptop, website, and server. And then as things became mobile, then we, 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 we came up with you know, we, we took the, the laptop and we turned them into phones and tablets, and then the websites became apps and the servers went into the cloud. And now we're at a point where we don't have to rely on, you know, a, a phone in our pocket because sensors can be ubiquitously around us, and that's sort of the, the advent of the IoT. And then we have these algos that float through that, which is, you know, your artificial intelligence. And then you've got uh, the cloud turning into a P2P network. 
you know, something like a blockchain, right? Distributed. And, and so what does that all mean to us in this room and, and globally? Well, I, I'm going to go back to my friend Sigmund. And, and what, what Sigmund said in Civilization and Discontents is that man has become a prosthetic God. And he also said that when he or she puts on all this auxiliary organs, right? He is truly magnificent. But here is the rub. Is that these organs have not grown on him naturally. And, and they still give him much trouble at times. So when you go and, 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 and Sigmund goes out and buys, you know, his Google Gloss, one, or even his Google Gloss 2, it ain't going to work because these are prosthetics that haven't grown on him organically. So although this is, wow, amazing stuff, it's, it's 007 stuff, you know, to have, you know, the, the power of data vision, right? It's, it's something that is, is kind of creepy. It doesn't quite fit into the way we deal with people around us. And if you don't have glasses on all the time, you're going to leave them at home or they're going to get lost, you know, under the pillow and the sofa. It, it's not a elegant prosthetic. Now, this is an elegant prosthetic, right? Because if I walk into a room and I say, you know, Okay, Google, I, I get the voice of God back. That, that's elegant, right? <laughs> and, 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 and it's not just about physicality. If you think of the most important superpower that we have, right? It's what? The, the power to buy, right? But even globally, to buy things, the muscle memory in buying something as a consumer is fundamentally different in different places. Like, for example, uh, in, in Canada and, and, uh, and Europe, you, you'll reach out and tap to purchase something through NFC, through chip and pin. But in Asia, you'll scan. And, and, and in some parts, uh, you know, backwaters of, of America, the US, you know, you'll still reach for a pen. And, uh, and, 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 and in Africa, you know, because of the preponderance of feature phones, you know, it, it's, it's gonna, you're going to be looking in your SMS inbox, right? So, so that dictates also what we're going to adopt and how we're going to adopt things. And, and you know, there's a great technology. I mean, look at, look at Bluetooth just announced that it's come out with Bluetooth 5.1, which is amazing. It just announced that now. And, and it's, it's, it's a huge step uh, in technology, now, you know, you can, uh, you can measure the angle of arrival and the angle of departure and, and elevation. So it's an X, Y, Z axis. And, and so that's down to a sub-meter accuracy. Now, that's great if you're a box. And it's great for warehouses, and it drives efficiency, and uh, it's quite amazing. You know, you see that box move through, and you know at the angle and where it's stored up on the, you know, the second uh, layer of some warehouse somewhere. But if I'm running around my house, I'm not going to have an embedded tag, and I may have my phone in my pocket, but I'm not going to take my phone into the shower. And, and so it's not necessarily an elegant prosthetic, and it may not be adopted in certain places where the human's involved. But what I really like is, is, is Soli. Now, Soli is a chip that takes radar and it miniaturizes it. Google's come out with the technology, and it's FCC approved. Um, and and what, what it allows you to do, essentially, is have incredibly accurate, accurate gesture um, control without touching anything. So through the radar, it knows if you're pushing a button, or if you want the audio to go up, all those knobs and dials evaporate. And now, just like my voice of God, I can use my gestures to interact. I don't have to have anything on me in order to interact and make myself into a superhero. So let's go back to our two protagonists. And, and, and for 25 years, I have been developing solutions for these two people in a park, right? Technology that makes them more efficient, 
gives them powers. But by putting all these senses around them doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to drive adoption. Just because I can drive solutioning doesn't mean there's going to be adoption. And, and it's not like a smart home where I could put sensors around and suddenly it's a smart home, or a sensors around a car and it's a smart car, or sensors around a school and it's a smart school. You can't put sensors around a person and say they're a smart person, <laughs> right? So, so what I, I, I sort of wanted to end with today was a, a quote from our superhero, Clark Kent, right? And, and he said, there's a superhero in all of us. Right? And I think the rest of that quote is something like, you have to have the courage to put on a cape. And I say to you, screw the cape. Right? You, you can't have a superhero by saying, go into some alleyway and change into a superhero suit. Right? Or, or for some bizarre reason, go into a telephone booth and change. Right? You, you have to design things that are more natively adopted by the human. And remember that this human is capricious, they're difficult, they messy. And we have to design for them, not only so it's a solution that works for them, but also that it's a solution that they will adopt. Thank you. <laughs>